Well, our lecturer this evening is Professor Jack Lynch, who is an assistant professor in the English department at Rutgers University, which boasts one of the finest collection of 18th century scholars in the country. Professor Lynch was educated both as an undergraduate and as a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania. His first book, entitled The Age of Elizabeth in the Age of Johnson, was published by Cambridge University Press last year, and he is under contract with Cambridge to produce a collection of essays that will provide new perspectives on Johnson's dictionary. He is the co-editor of the annual periodical entitled The Age of Johnson, and he is the compiler of a bibliography of Johnsonian studies in the 1980s and 1990s. And he is currently working on a new monograph, which is going to focus on 18th century forgery, fakery, and fraud. <laughs> that is not his topic this evening, which is obviously based on his new book, which is entitled Samuel Johnson's Dictionary, Selections from the 1755 Work that Defined the English Language. So please join me in welcoming Professor Jack Lynch to the Boston Athenaeum. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my plan tonight is to read a prepared text that is a resolutely unscholarly introduction to what we can do with Johnson's Dictionary, and then I'm happy to entertain questions that needn't come directly from the talk, anything that I can try to answer relating to Johnson, relating to dictionaries in general. I'll, I'll be glad to do my best. <clears throat> well. I suppose when authors are invited to talk about their books, they usually give readings from them. So since I have about 45 minutes, I thought I'd read from my abridgment of Johnson's Dictionary, beginning with the letter A. <laughs> abaft, adverb of abaftan, Saxon, behind, from the forepart of the ship towards the stern. Abonition. Noun substantive, Latin abonitio, a banishment for one or two years. Relax, I, I have no plans to read a dictionary. For three quarters of an hour, it make for a longer evening than perhaps you bargain for. But the oddity of this gesture, the thought of reading from a dictionary, reminds us that dictionaries aren't like most books. No one reads a dictionary. But if you don't read a book, what on earth do you do with it? And more to the point, why should anyone care about a new edition of an unreadable book? Well, let's begin with some qualifications. Some people through history have read dictionaries. Some scholars, for instance, get paid to do it. When Robert Birchfield was commissioned to supplement the Oxford English Dictionary, he read the whole thing, 13 volumes, all 15,490 pages, all 178 miles of type. Others read dictionaries when they have plenty of time on their hands. While Malcolm X sat in prison, he tells us in his autobiography, he read a dictionary and copied out many passages. And a number of famous writers have worked their way through Johnson's dictionary itself. The historian William Robertson read the whole work twice. And Robert Browning qualified himself to be a poet by reading and digesting the whole of Johnson's dictionary. I confess that when I was an undergraduate, I owned a set of the Oxford English Dictionary, and I always hoped that visitors to my dorm room would notice the, the bookmark sticking ostentatiously out of the first volume and conclude I was reading the whole thing. Well, I don't expect you to read the entire book. Still. It's odd, it's an odd paradox that every bookish person knows about Johnson's Dictionary of the English Language. Many can quote a few famous definitions, like those for oats and patron. Among bibliophiles, it's perhaps the second most famous book in English, behind only the first folio of Shakespeare's works. And yet, for all the respect it gets, few people have any idea what to do with it and hardly anyone has actually glimpsed at its contents. I imagine many people want to own it because it's the first English dictionary, right? Alas, that's nothing but a myth. 
There were dozens of English dictionaries by the time Johnson began work on his, and they'd been coming out for a century and a half. Why then should we even bother flipping through it? It's not the first English dictionary, so simple historical priority is out. It's obviously not the most recent one. Some books improve with age, but a dictionary? We're now a few months shy of the book's 249th birthday, well past its sell-by date. Surely it's of no more use than a 30-year-old phone book. But in this talk, I'd like to discuss some of the attractions this woefully obsolete book has for us today. I'm going to argue that Johnson's Dictionary of the, the English Language is not only worth browsing, not only worth reading, but I'll go so far as to say it is among the most fascinating books in all of English literature. The problem we perceive with reading from a dictionary comes from preconceptions about genre. If we regard a dictionary strictly as a collection of words, then only devoted word lovers will care. Johnson knew better. Words, he wrote, are the daughters of the earth and things are the sons of heaven. What I'm arguing for tonight is for an unfamiliar approach to a word book, one that gives full attention to the things inside it. Of course, for some people, words are plenty. Lovers of old, obscure, and eccentric words, those who fancy the superior person's book of words, always get a kick out of the quirkier entries in Johnson. In fact, you'll find many sesquipedalian juggernauts in Johnson, not only in his dictionary. He was widely criticized in his own day for his fondness for Latinate diction. In 1767, the critic Archibald Campbell twitted him in a work called Lexiphanes, where Johnson appears as a character spouting sentences like this. Expulse hereditary aggregates and agglomerated asperities which may adumbrate your intellectual luminaries with the clouds of obscurity or obthorate the part porches of your intelligence with the adsitious excrement of critical malevolence. <clears throat> That's a bum rap. Um, Johnson's language, contrary to the myth, could be admirably simple and direct. His dictionary, moreover, gave less attention to these obscure inkhorn terms, as they're called, than any previous lexicographer had. But plenty of inkhorn words remain, and for word lovers, they can be a hoot. How about nidification, meaning the act of building nests, or gemelliparous, bearing twins? You can impress the dickens out of your scrabble-playing friends with words like Ophiophagus, serpent eating, galericulate, covered as with a hat, and I'll add another one just for tonight, frigorific, causing cold. There are also some priceless insults and put-downs, words like blunderhead, fopdoodle, and pickle herring. A blouse is a ruddy, fat-faced wench. A clodpate is a stupid fellow, a dolt, a thick skull. And a slubberty gullion is a paltry, dirty, sorry wretch. Well, long forgotten insults can be fun, but more interesting are words that are still around, but with changed meanings. In 1755, for instance, a pencil was a small brush of hair which painters dip in their colors. Dixon Ticonderoga is nowhere to be found. A shirt meant men's underwear, and bowels could mean tenderness or compassion. A urinator was, curiously enough, a diver, one who searches underwater. Other changed meanings can be even more illuminating because they tell us something about a changed world. Enthusiasm today, for instance, is one of the cardinal virtues. Human resources departments expect to see it in every letter of recommendation. In Johnson's day, however, enthusiasm was a vain belief of private revelation, a vain confidence of divine favor or communication. In other words, a mental imbalance where someone was convinced God was speaking to him. After the disastrous civil wars of the 17th century, when religion was used to justify often indiscriminate slaughter, 
Britons declared religious inspiration out of bounds in civil society. To call an employee enthusiastic in the 18th century, therefore, would be to call him a dangerous lunatic. It's time to pause, though, because so far I've been making the case for reading old dictionaries, but not necessarily Johnson's dictionary. After all, any old dictionary from the past will tell us what pencil or enthusiasm meant when those books were written. Why then publish selections from Samuel Johnson's dictionary instead of, say, Edward Phillips's New World of Words or Nathan Bailey's Dictionarium Britannicum? The difference is that Johnson's dictionary is the only one that can be called a great work of literature. Johnson's uniquely powerful mind is visible on every page, and it's that mind that makes his dictionary one of the very few reference books still worth reading so long after it became obsolete as a working reference. We live in an age when dictionaries are the work of impersonal committees. The six-page masthead of the most recent American Heritage Dictionary, to consider a very fine modern example, sports a director of lexical publishing, an executive editor, an editorial project director, a managing editor, four editors, two associate editors, 11 consulting editors, an editorial assistant, four proofreaders, three citations assistants, an art researcher, two production supervisors, a database supervisor, three coordinators, three designers, three administrative assistants, five pre-press developers, 36 special contributors, 79 previous special contributors, and a usage panel made up of 205 experts still drawing breath, and another 43 who didn't live to see the work's publication. <laughs> That's a total of 41 full-timers on the payroll, another 115 paid consultants, and 248 others who pitched in with substantial work. They're headquartered in a fine building right here in Boston, and of course they have access to some of the finest libraries in the world. Now, compare this army of 409 scholars to what Johnson had at his disposal. Himself, working part-time, six unreliable assistants he had to pay out of his own pocket, the attic in the house he was renting, and whatever books he happened to own or was able to borrow. So, how do you go about writing a dictionary by yourself? Well, the first task is coming up with a list of words. Listing them off the top of your head probably isn't the most efficient way to go. Now, Johnson arrived at a solution which was both new to English lexicography and influential for the entire tradition of dictionary making ever since. He drew his words from the greatest writers in English. Words, he realized, get their meaning, not from the arbitrary whim of a lexicographer, but from the best people who've used them before. Convinced that the chief glory of every people arises from its authors, he read widely in hundreds of English writers. This is an important decision. It seems to owe a lot to the English common law tradition, in which law arises not from edict, but from precedent. And it has important lexicographical consequences, because it turns the greatest writers, from Sidney to Swift, into Johnson's collaborators in fixing the English language. He therefore included some 114,000 quotations to show how they had used these words. Almost every word gets at least one quotation, and some tricky words can be illustrated by dozens or hundreds of quotations to show all the subtle shadings of meaning and usage. It also gives us another reason to read this book. The dictionary <clears throat> is in fact one of the most extensive anthologies of great English writing ever compiled. At the head of the pack was Shakespeare, whose works Johnson knew intimately. After finishing his dictionary, he turned his attention to producing an extensively annotated edition of Shakespeare, which appeared in eight volumes in 1765. He praised Shakespeare as the best guide to the language of common life, and he quoted from all of his plays in the dictionary. Other major authors from the late 16th through the middle 18th century provided most of the other quotations. Sir Philip Sidney, Francis Bacon, 
John Milton, John Dryden, Joseph Addison, Jonathan Swift, and Alexander Pope are all quoted thousands of times. Johnson also read and quoted Christian writers like Richard Hooker and Richard Alstree, philosophers like John Locke and Joseph Glanville, scientists like Sir Isaac Newton and Robert Boyle, statesmen like the Earl of Clarendon and Sir William Temple, and physicians like John Arbuthnot and John Quincy. All these authorities contribute hundreds of quotations. Once the words and quotations were collected, Johnson began writing the dictionary, the definitions, and assembling the materials into a usable form. This was the most demanding work he did, and it's where he shows his talents most clearly. Many people think the hardest words to define would be the most obscure, words like obnubilate and orphanotrophy. In fact, they're as easy as can be. Much more challenging are the most common words in the language, those with many senses that require careful discrimination. And no one before Johnson had ever tried to discern all the subtle distinctions between the various senses. He was the first to spell out the dozens of meanings of most familiar English words. Civil, with its 12 numbered senses, spirit, with 19, and heart, with 20, show, show his attention to some of the most difficult problems in lexicography. To give you an idea of how much, of the amount of effort a common word demands, consider the word take. Nathan Bailey, Johnson's most important predecessor, wrote an entry for take that occupies just 362 words of definition and illustration. Johnson's entries for take, on the other hand, with 133 numbered senses and 363 quotations, run to more than 8,000 words. Johnson's originality is often overstated, beginning with the first dictionary myth but in this respect, what he was doing was genuinely new in English lexicography. He was sailing in uncharted waters, and he was sailing alone. Sometimes the dictionary suffered from Johnson's solitary labors. He made his share of blunders. The most famous came when he wrote that a pastern is the knee of an horse. It's not. It's the part of the foot between the fetlock and the hoof. A lady once asked him how he came to define pastern that way. Boswell tells us that instead of making an elaborate defense, as she expected, he at once answered, ignorance, madam, pure ignorance. <laughs> it was apparently ignorance that led him into other errors, although windward and leeward are direct opposites, for instance, Johnson defined them exactly the same way, towards the wind. Not all the dictionary's weaknesses resulted from Johnson's ignorance. Some apparently came from his knowing too much. If you were to read that a cough is a convulsion of the lungs vellicated by some sharp serosity, or that a network is anything reticulated or decussated at equal distances with interstices between the intersections, you wouldn't know much more than when you began. But these are the rare exceptions, and on balance, we should probably be grateful that Johnson did his work without database supervisors and administrative assistants. It allowed his mind to roam at liberty. There was no bureaucratic procrustes to squeeze him into somebody's idea of what a dictionary is supposed to be. Modern readers are often most attracted to those entries where he defies our notions of what's appropriate in a reference book as when he introduces personal opinions. He's usually very restrained and businesslike in his definitions and usage notes, but every so often, well, he can't help himself. We're taught that vaulty, V-A-U-L-T-Y, for instance, is a bad word. <laughs> and that the spelling through T-H-R-O apostrophe is contracted by barbarians from through, T-H-R-O-U-G-H, Rus is a French word neither elegant nor necessary. <laughs> Surely an editorial project director or production supervisor would have told him to keep such opinions to himself. 
Occasionally, he assert, inserts himself into his work in other peculiar ways. The entry for Lich, a dead carcass, includes a curious interjection, salve magna parens. Classically educated readers would have been able to translate it as hail great mother, but only those who knew Johnson's family history would realize this salutation to Lich was actually his facetious tribute to the town of his birth, Lichfield. <clears throat> he likewise shows off his classical learning at the same time he confesses his humble origins in London's Grub Street, originally the name of a street in Moorfields in London, much inhabited by writers of small histories, dictionaries, and temporary poems, whence any mean production is called Grub Street. Not only does he include himself among these writers of mean productions by listing dictionaries among their products, he introduces a pair of untranslated Greek lines. Kair ithake met aethla met alge pikra aspasios teon udas ikanomai. Once again, it would take an extremely learned reader to realize that he was ironically praising his humble writerly origins by invoking Ulysses' cry, Hail Ithaca, after pains and bitter hardships, I happily reach your soil. <laughs> Johnson himself was even present at the origins of a few words. Consider magazine, which in its literal sense means a storehouse, commonly an arsenal or armory or repository of provisions. Then comes another more familiar definition, of late, this word has signified a miscellaneous pamphlet from the periodical miscellany named The Gentleman's Magazine by Edward Cave. This was the first publication to use the word magazine in its title because it collected odds and ends from other publications. Cave named his new periodical after a storehouse or an arsenal. Johnson himself was very involved in The Gentleman's Magazine, which began appearing in 1731 just three years later, while he was still in the Midlands, Johnson wrote to Cave, offering to contribute short literary dissertations in Latin or English. But Cave, a savvy businessman who had some idea of the size of the market for Latin dissertations, didn't bite. <laughs> Persistence, though, paid off, and Johnson became a regular contributor in 1738. Entries like this in which we can see the first real magazine, a borning, remind us that a dictionary gives us a snapshot not only of the language, but of the world. It captures a moment in history, and in some ways it gives us a better portrait of an age than a novel or even a history textbook. Though the title page reads, A Dictionary of the English Language, we can almost treat it as an encyclopedia of the English nation. And this, I'll argue, is one of the best reasons for consulting, browsing, or even reading a dictionary, especially this dictionary, so long after it was written. Johnson's compendium of the language offers us a window onto his world. The boundary between dictionaries and encyclopedias is notoriously difficult to draw. Dictionaries are supposedly about words and encyclopedias about things, but linguists today wring their hands over how to separate the two. Johnson doesn't seem to have worried about it much, but he often provides much more information than a simple dictionary definition calls for. Many of his entries seem to belong in an encyclopedia rather than a lexicon. We have no reason to complain, though, because these entries are often the most enlightening. Consider, for instance, the long entry for opium, adapted from John Hill's Materia Medica. Opium is a juice, partly of the rosinous, partly of the gummy kind. After discussing in some detail how it's grown and processed, Johnson notes that the ancients were greatly divided about the virtues and use of opium, some calling it a poison, and others the greatest of all medicines. At present, it is in high esteem. So much for just say no. <laughs> then come comments on its effects. Its first effect, he says, is making the patient cheerful, as if he had drank moderately of wine. 
It removes melancholy, excites boldness, and dissipates the dread of danger. And for this reason, the Turks always take it when they are going into battle in a larger dose than ordinary. An immoderate dose of opium, Johnson continues, brings on a sort of drunkenness, cheerfulness and loud laughter at first, and after many terrible symptoms, death itself. Such entries can teach us much about, for instance, early modern medicine. Some medical words, for instance, strike us as surprisingly modern for 1755. Anorexy is inappetency or loathing of food. Alternative medicine enthusiasts may be surprised to hear Johnson praise the merits of ginseng, a root brought lately into Europe, which the Asiatics in general think almost an universal medicine, and which Europeans consider useful for convulsions, vertigos, and all nervous complaints. Other medical entries sound quaintly antiquarian. Not many of us complain of agues these days, an intermitting fever, with cold fits succeeded by hot, nor do we think the word abracadabra is likely to work as a superstitious charm against agues. King's evil is a scrofulous distemper in which the glands are ulcerated, commonly believed to be cured by the touch of the king. Some entries remind us that 18th century medicine could be sadly ineffectual. Cancer is a virulent swelling or sore not to be cured. And some of the more barbarous entries make you exceedingly glad you were born in the 20th century rather than the 18th. A catheter, for instance, is a hollow and somewhat crooked instrument to thrust into the bladder. <clears throat> the dictionary is also valuable for its insights into the history of science, which was going through one of its most exciting periods. Consider chemistry. Johnson has to note that the word gas, G-A-S, is invented by the chemists because it was a newfangled notion. Robert Boyle's gas laws, now familiar to every 10th grader, were still fairly new, and Joseph Priestley had not yet discovered oxygen. Despite the impressive strides being made in chemistry, though, we still can't quite forget that this was a pre-modern world. Phlogiston was still understood to be the inflammable principle in every body, Antoine Laurent Lavoisier wouldn't spell out the rudiments of modern atomic theory until 1789, after Johnson's death. As a result, elements is defined as earth, fire, air, water, of which our world is composed. And the elixir is the liquor with which chemists hope to transmute metals into gold. The alchemist had not yet entirely superseded had not yet entirely been superseded by the chemist. A chemist, by the way, is a professor of chemistry, a philosopher by fire. A definition so impressive that I almost wish I hadn't gone to graduate school in English. I'd, I'd trade it all to be a philosopher by fire. <laughs> if chemistry was still straddle, straddling the line between the ancient and the modern worlds, mathematics was advancing rapidly. Johnson was writing not long after Newton and Leibniz developed the calculus, and he describes this new doctrine of infinitesimals or infinitely small quantities called the arithmetic of fluxions. And we might be surprised to read a detailed entry about binary arithmetic, something most of us probably assumed was an invention of the computer age. We're more surprised to see calculator and computer in 1755 until we realize they're not machines but people who do arithmetic. And as sciences like astronomy made the world bigger, mathematics had to be prepared to describe it. Johnson refers to a recent word invented by Locke that tried to address this growing universe. A trillion is a million of millions of millions. Eat your heart out, Carl Sagan. Not all the technology described in the book had actually appeared. In the entry for volant, which means flying or passing through the air, we get a quotation from John Wilkins's mathematical magic on the volant or flying automata, 
which are mechanical contrivances with a self-motion whereby they are carried aloft in the air like birds. In 1755, such mechanical contrivances were still science fiction. Humans wouldn't leave the surface of the earth for another three decades when the Montgolfier brothers demonstrated their first hot air balloons. But Johnson was captivated by dreams of flight his entire life. He was alive, in fact, when the Montgolfiers took off in June 1783, and in December of that year, when he had less than a year to live, he wrote excitedly to a friend, the air balloon has taken full possession with a very good claim of every philosophical mind and mouth. Do you not wish for the flying coach? Johnson's entry for electricity is among my favorites. He begins with a short definition lifted from a contemporary science writer, John Quincy. Electricity is a property in some bodies whereby when rubbed so as to grow warm, they draw little bits of paper or such like substances to them. But he then adds his own postscript. Such was the account given a few years ago of electricity. But the industry of the present age has discovered in electricity a multitude of philosophical wonders. He describes a few of these sublime wonders. Bodies electrified by a sphere of glass not only emit flame, but may be fitted with such a quantity of the electrical vapor as, if discharged at once upon a human body, would endanger life. And then he concludes with a bit of news. The philosophers are now endeavoring to intercept the strokes of lightning. Of course, the philosopher most involved with the strokes of lightning was Benjamin Franklin, whose experiments and observations on electricity appeared in 1751, just four years before the dictionary was completed. The kite and key experiment is one of the most famous moments in the history of science, up there with Archimedes' Eureka, and Sir Isaac Newton's apple. It also has, unlike Newton's apple, the merit of being a true story. It's familiar to all of us from childhood, and it's hard to remember that it was once current events. But for Johnson's first readers, this was news, more recent for them than the cloning of Dolly the sheep is for us. The age's excitement over the newly discovered properties of electricity is palpable in this entry. Franklin isn't the only important scientist to be mentioned. Sir Isaac Newton was the scientific genius who dominated his age. Nature and nature's laws lay hid in night, wrote Alexander Pope. God said, let Newton be, and all was light. He had been dead only 20 years when Johnson began work on the dictionary. His Principia may have been the single most influential scientific book in history, with its famous laws of motion and gravitation. It therefore shouldn't be surprising that Newton is there to illustrate that power which we call gravity. Even better known among lay readers was Newton's optics, first published in 1704, which demonstrated that white light was made up of all the colors of the spectrum. And so Johnson turns to Newton, who provides quotations for light, prism, spectrum, and rainbow. <clears throat> Newton's newly explained rainbow is a good place to conclude. I'd like to finish my talk by looking closely at this entry because it embodies much of what makes Johnson's dictionary so fascinating. We start off with the head word, rainbow, with an accent marked on the first syllable. Then comes the abbreviation NS for noun substantive and an etymology. It's no surprise that rainbow comes from rain and bow. Then comes Johnson's definition, which is worth examining carefully. The iris, the semicircle of various colors which appears in showery weather. Notice that first he gives a simple synonym, the iris, a word which, though unfamiliar now, would have been known to all readers in 1755. It was not only familiar, but evocative. Literate readers would know the word came from the Greek goddess Iris, whose symbol was the rainbow. Then comes the clarification, the semicircle of various colors which appears in showery weather. 
Critics, as I noted, have long enjoyed making fun of the density of Johnson's definitions and pointing to his interstices between intersections vellicated by some sharp serosity, but this one is much more characteristic of his usual practice. It's clear, simple, and accessible. Much more so, in fact, than the definition in the modern American Heritage Dictionary. There we're taught that a rainbow is an arc of spectral colors appearing in the sky opposite the sun as a result of the refractive dispersion of sunlight in drops of rain or mist. Now, arc may be shorter than Johnson's semicircle, but it's probably less informative for most readers, and refractive dispersion is likely to send beginners, at least, to other definitions before they can understand this one. Perhaps, though, you want that encyclopedic information and feel cheated that Johnson has merely said it appears in showery weather without explaining the physics of how. But Johnson doesn't duck the scientific questions. He actually provides more information than American heritage, but it appears not in the definition, but in the illustrative quotations. He takes a long quotation from Newton's optics, at once showing the word's usage in a scientific context and giving his early readers up-to-date information on the physics of refraction straight from the man who discovered it. This is Newton. The rainbow never appears but where it rains in the sunshine and may be made artificially by spouting up water, which may break aloft and scatter into drops and fall down like rain. For the sun, shining upon those drops, certainly causes the bow to appear to a spectator standing in a true position to the rain and sun. The bow is made by refraction of the sun's light in drops of falling rain. Of course, the rainbow isn't merely refracted sunlight, whatever the scientists may say. It's also Iris, the beautiful messenger of Zeus and Hera. And it's the symbol of God's promise to his creation. And so alongside the scientific quotation, we find several more literary ones. Sir Philip Sidney provides one. Casting of the water in a most cunning manner makes a perfect rainbow, not more pleasant to the eye than to the mind, so sensibly to see the proof of the heavenly iris. An even more famous writer appears with Sidney. Johnson quotes Shakespeare's King John to add another hue unto the rainbow which comes from the same speech that gives us to gild refined gold to paint the lily. He also quotes England's greatest satirist, Alexander Pope, whose temple of fame describes a splendid allegorical structure. The dome's high arch reflects the mingled blaze and forms a rainbow of alternate rays. Although dictionaries are textual, Rainbows are inevitably visual. That's why Johnson decided to draw on Henry Peacham, the 17th century author of an often reprinted work on watercolors. The rainbow, writes Peacham, is drawn like a nymph with large wings dispread in the form of a semicircle, the feathers of sundry colors. Johnson also quotes Sir Thomas Brown's Pseudodoxia Epidemica, better known as Vulgar Errors, on the role of the Tower of Babel. Many think it was built by the ancient Hebrews to secure themselves from a second deluge, but Brown says any Bible reader should know better. They could not be ignorant of the promise of God never to drown the world and the rainbow before their eyes to put them in mind of it. Now, other old dictionaries might suggest some of this, but none had the scope of Johnson's encyclopedic dictionary because no other lexicographer had the scope of Johnson's encyclopedic mind. He ranged over the entire circle of sciences, the entire round of learning, the very words he uses to define encyclopedia. Where else could we see England's greatest scientist standing next to her greatest playwright, the embodiment of courtliness jostling against the most vicious satirist, an artist describing erotic drawings while a scholar discusses God's promise on Ararat? He lets us approach the rainbow linguistically, scientifically, poetically, artistically, historically, and this is perfectly typical of Johnson's work. 
In this talk, I've drawn especially on entries from science, technology, and medicine, but many other kinds of encyclopedic information can be found in the dictionary's pages. I mentioned Johnson's debt to the common law. In working on his dictionary, he drew on several legal dictionaries and handbooks, like John Cowell's Interpreter and John Aliff's Parergon Juris Canonici Anglicani. There are hundreds of legal terms, from alias to vavasor, introducing us to the legal and political world that gave birth to our own legal system. We get a sense of the various social ranks in Johnson's world, from the lowliest boot catchers, skip kennels, and kitchen wenches, to the noblest sultans, mandarins, and viziers. The dictionary includes a long entry on a drink prepared from berries, very familiar in Europe for these 80 years, he means coffee, and another Chinese plant of which the infusion has lately been much drunk in Europe, tea, both comparative novelties in 18th century England. Well, I doubt I've convinced many of you to read the dictionary from cover to cover, or since it originally appeared in two volumes, from cover to cover to cover to cover, all 2,300 pages, 43,000 entries, all 114,000 illustrative quotations. Still, I hope I have persuaded you that this obsolete and unreadable book is still worth a browse. The case I'm trying to make is that even those who don't care a whit for principles of lexicography, who don't thrill to novel theories of etymology, who can't spare a moment for the finer points of phrasal verbs, can still find much to care about in the dictionary. It's the most comprehensive book of its age, not least because it's made up of bits and pieces of thousands of other books. As John Dryden said of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, here is God's plenty. Thanks. <laughs> I'm happy to entertain questions, comments. I only ask you to wait for a microphone to get near you. So. How did you decide the, uh, on the words to, uh, for your new book? How did I decide on words? I used a very strict scientific methodology, which is if I liked it, it went in. Um, <laughs> the, the, selections, uh, the principle of selection and the abridgment I did it was not meant to be a working practical dictionary, but a selection from it suitable for browsing through, for flipping through. So I felt no obligation to be comprehensive. What I tended to do, first I included all of the famous definitions, um, Johnson's definitions of Oates and Patron and Tory and Whig and so on. Lexicographer is a, uh, a harmless drudge and so on. Um, <laughs> I focused especially on words that have changed meaning over time. I focused on words that show up prominently in the literature of the period, the ones I often found myself explaining to my students, um, words that were important in the middle of the 18th century or, or a bit later. Um, for instance, Jane Austen's original readers, if they wanted to know what sense and sensibility, pride and prejudice meant, they could turn to Johnson's dictionary. Um, the dictionary still often comes up fairly often in debates over the US Constitution, because when people need to settle what does a word in the Constitution mean, it's easiest to turn to the dictionary that was current when the Constitution was written. So what's a militia? What is abridgment and so on? So I included those words. I included a fair selection of those that struck me as funny or curious. Um, I think my, my favorite funny or curious one is anatiferous, which means producing ducks. <laughs> See if you can slip it into conversation. Um, I just did. Uh, but I, I picked uh, a, a wide range of words. I, I included some of the long encyclopedic ones. I included anything that struck me as, as worth raising an eyebrow over. So it was not at all scientific. It was purely a, a browser's dictionary.
Well, in fact, the scholar Alan Reddick argues that Johnson revised his dictionary more than he revised any other work he wrote. Um, the first edition came out in two gigantic volumes in 1755, uh, and although it, it was important, it was recognized as important right away, it wasn't selling well. It, it sold at four pounds ten shillings, and to put that in perspective, a day laborer would take well over a month to earn that much money. And they tried various schemes to sell it, but the next year they came up with the clever idea of an abridgment, which dropped much of the encyclopedic information, which shortened many of the entries, and that sold well. But Johnson apparently did the abridgment himself. Um, and then, 18 years later, in 1773, the fourth edition um, was very significantly revised by Johnson, so he made many thousands of revisions, adding quotations, clarifying definitions, and so on. So he, he did recognize it was imperfect. Uh, in fact, let me read the, the quotations from Johnson with which I end the, the editor's introduction to this edition. Um, let me see. Oh, I'm not going to find it in a hurry, I'm afraid. Ah, oh, there it is. Yes, he says, of dictionaries, a perfect performance of any kind is not to be expected, and certainly not a perfect dictionary. Um, he said, dictionaries are like watches. The worst is better than none, and the best cannot be expected to go quite true. But he wasn't always quite so modest when Boswell once told him that you didn't know what you were doing when you, were, when you undertook your dictionary. Johnson said, yes, sir, I knew very well what I was undertaking and very well how to do it, and I have done it very well. There's <laughs> a question over here. I can't recall. Um, I, I will confess that from the very day that I sent the final copy to the publisher, every day since then I've experienced the literary equivalent of buyer's remorse as I curse the stars and say, damn, I should have put that one in the book. Um, there are a great many words I wish I had included, and I don't recall off the top of my head if the unabridged one has that. I'll, I'll have a look and get back to you if you like. You, you mentioned uh, that Johnson's methods were uh, unique at, at that time in English lexicography. Yes. I was wondering if there were continental precedents that differed or, or uh, began to find that. Yes, he, his, his precedents were mostly continental. The Academia della Crusca in Italy had done a similar dictionary on a similar pr uh, plan, and the Académie Française had done their great dictionary. Uh, Johnson liked comparing himself to these projects. In fact, he, he, he traded dictionaries with both the Italian and the French academies, uh, which is pretty remarkable when you think about the most distinguished literary bodies in both countries being put on par with one man working in his attic with six part-time assistants. Um, and in fact, when he announced that he was going to do this dictionary single-handed, he said he would do it in three years, which caused people to guffaw. Um, and they pointed out that the French Academy had 40 scholars working on a similar dictionary for 40 years. And he said, well, let's see. This is the proportion. 40 times 40 is 1,600. As 3 is to 1,600, so is the proportion of an Englishman to a Frenchman. <laughs> Um, but they did provide the best models for them, and he really did respect their dictionaries very much. Yeah. <laughs> 
Your memory is very good, and that may be the nastiest poison pen letter in the English language. Yes. Um, Johnson secured an advance from his publishers of 1,575 pounds. Um, in modern terms, it's very, very difficult to, to translate 18th century money to the present, but a rough guess might be that was the equivalent of maybe $150,000, which may sound like a lot until you realize it supports Johnson and six assistants for nine years, and when you start dividing it, it no longer sounds so impressive. Projects of this scope would typically be undertaken uh, with the support of a patron, and the usual arrangement was you would approach a wealthy nobleman, agree to write a dedication to him or her in return for financial support, and Johnson approached Lord Chesterfield, one of the most distinguished patrons. The myth that's grown up is that Chesterton brushed him off entirely. Chesterfield, I'm sorry, brushed him off entirely. Um, in fact, Chesterfield did provide him with some financial support, at least 10 pounds, perhaps some more. Um, it, it's turned into one of these great myths that Johnson was repulsed from his door and so on. Um, but certainly he didn't provide the support that a patron was expected to provide. When the dictionary was about to come out, though, the buzz was that this was going to be a major work of scholarship. And Chesterfield decided he wanted in. So he wrote a few reviews, technically anonymous, but everyone quickly knew that they were his, um, declaring this dictionary is the greatest thing ever written. And it's very clear he was angling for the dedication after providing no serious support for eight years. So yes, Johnson wrote this very, very bitter letter. I reproduced the whole thing in the introduction um, to the, the edition of the dictionary, um, but it includes the famous lines, is not a patron, my lord, one who looks with unconcern upon a man struggling in the water, and then as he approaches the shore, encumbers him with help. <laughs> yes. What happened with dictionaries subsequently is a good question. Um, Johnson's became a brand name for authority. Johnson, uh, dictionaries calling themselves Johnson's were appearing in the 1880s. By that point, they had very little of Johnson left in them. They had been updated and revised and abridged and expanded so many times that little of Johnson actually remained. But Johnson's name was a byword for authority. Most of what happened for the next 50 years was people revising it and, and using it as a base for their own sorts of dictionaries. The first major dictionary to come out after Johnson's, the one uh, that, that has become in America the byword for linguistic authority, is Webster. And Webster was very consciously writing a nationalistic American dictionary. And Johnson was very much his target. Webster actually reviewed Johnson's dictionary several times and said, not a page in it is correct. <laughs> uh, so he very consciously set out to write a, a dictionary that escaped from Johnson's authority. That quickly established itself in America as the authoritative dictionary. Johnson's, even though many other dictionaries had come out, though, in, in Britain, Johnson's remained the dictionary, the standard dictionary, until the Oxford English Dictionary. And in fact, when the Oxford English Dictionary was first being considered in 1856, 57, um, 102 years after Johnson, the initial plan was simply to give Johnson's dictionary a thorough revision. Eventually, they realized they had to start from scratch. But even the OED contains more than 1,700 definitions that are just directly quoted from Johnson and attributed to J. <laughs> <laughs> are you aware if there's any move to publish the whole dictionary anywhere? Any better online? On the CD? There is a, a fantastic CD-ROM edition of it, and I couldn't have done this project without it. It's edited by Anne McDermott, of the University of Birmingham, and it's published by Cambridge University Press. It contains 
complete transcriptions and page images of every page in both the first and the fourth edition. So you can put them on split screens and see how they change. Uh, it's a few hundred dollars. It's not an awful lot of money. In fact, it's cheaper than buying a modern facsimile reprint of either one of the editions. Um, so that's a fantastic project. Anne McDermott, with whom I'm editing this planned collection of essays on the dictionary, has been working for many years on a complete edition, in a way the first ever edition of Johnson's Dictionary. She's had an impressive team who have been trying to track down every single quotation um, where it came from, often which edition Johnson worked with, uh, fixing all of his incorrect citations and so on. That's the work of decades to, to complete it. Um, it's unknown yet what form this thing will take in the end, whether it will be in print, strictly electronic, both, we don't know. But um, yes, there are, for, for the first time, there's a major scholarly project afoot to make it more available. I don't know of any losses beyond his own control, although you might know there's a, a wonderful Blackadder episode in which um, Blackadder's butler inadvertently burns the only copy of the manuscript of the dictionary, and then he and his servant have to try to recreate it overnight. Um, what did happen, there were several setbacks. Johnson got up to the letter C and then realized his plan was wrong had to scrap it and start over. Uh, he got pretty far into the dictionary, but his assistants had been copying the text onto two sides of a page. The publisher said, we can't work with this, so the whole thing had to be copied out again on one side of a page at great expense. There were a great many setbacks like that. And I, I said he said he could do it in three years. Well, it took him nine, uh, which is... It was enough of an overrun to have publishers upset at him. Still, it, it seems almost superhuman to write a dictionary yourself in, in nine years, uh, but the publishers who had promised this thing were, were nagging him all the while. Uh, meanwhile, he was busy with many other things. His, his only play was produced during this period. His most famous poem, Vanity of Human Wishes, came out while he was working on the dictionary. He did a series of 208 essays that came out twice weekly called The Rambler, right in the middle of this project. So this was in his spare time for nine years. <laughs> One back there. We wish we knew more about that, but we do know a bit. The way he worked was he read through all of these books. Um, mind you, he, th there weren't public libraries as, as we understand them today, so he mostly worked with books he owned or that he could borrow from friends. And well, let's say he wasn't as careful with other people's property as he might have been. Um, and some of these books were kept as souvenirs by people once the dictionary. Many of them were, were very upset when they got their damaged books back. But uh, they do let us see how he worked. What he would do is he would read through books. Um, he would then mark passages that he wanted to include as quotations with a vertical pencil mark at the beginning and the end. He would underline the word he wanted to illustrate and then he'd write the capital letter of that word in the margin. And when he had finished going through an entire book, uh, or whatever parts of the book he decided to look at, he would pass those on to his six assistants, the amanuenses, who would then copy them out onto slips of paper and would cross out the marginal letters to show they had done it. Um, I mentioned Anne McDermott. She's on a, a wonderful puzzle. Um, she's noted that there are different sorts of crossings through of these marginal letters, some vertical, some horizontal, some diagonal, uh, and there seems to be a pattern to it, but no one has figured out what it is yet. <laughs> he would then take these 200, 300,000 slips of quotations and assemble them, 
decide which ones he wanted to keep. Early he was keeping more than he ended up keeping, so the letter A is fatter than most of the other letters. Around the middle of C he realized he can't keep up this pace. It, the, the bulk would fright away the student. And um, then he began writing out his, his definitions. He did look at some other dictionaries to look for words that he missed. He, he notes in his preface that when he finished, when he was all but finished, he realized that he had missed the word see, S-E-A, and had to go back and hunt for, for examples of it. Um, and he did miss some words that way, but that's more or less the way he worked. It still would require an amazing mind just to know which words to mark in the books as you read. But he did have a, a fabulously copious memory. He could quote thousands of lines from memory. And in fact, it looks as if many of the quotations in the dictionary may be from memory. There's some signs when they're occasionally slightly off, the sort of thing that would make sense if it is either orally transmitted or memorized, but not the sort of mistake you'd make if you're transcribing visually. I teach 18th century British lit, which means I'm always concerned about exactly what a word means when I'm, I'm writing it. I work especially on Samuel Johnson, um, who is a major literary figure, and although we often forget it, this is the longest work by Johnson. Um, and the, the dissertation I wrote, which became my first book, The Age of Elizabeth in the Age of Johnson, was about the way 18th century Britons perceived the thing we now call the Renaissance. So one of the things that I was interested in, the first time I worked seriously with the dictionary, was checking all the quotations from Spencer. There are over 3,000 of them in the dictionary. Uh, looking to see what Johnson did with Shakespeare. It's one way to tell which plays were most popular, or at least mo of most interest to him, to see which ones he quotes most often. So that's how I began working on it. Um, and then when I was approached by Levenger Press and later Walker Press about doing this, it seemed to me mostly a wonderful excuse for me to get the, to know the dictionary as well as I always wished I did. So I, it was an excuse finally to read the whole dictionary, which I'd never done before. There's a house in London that's Johnson's house. Yes. Is that Exactly. That is the one house in London in which Johnson lived that still stands. It's the house on Gough Square. Uh, it's now a museum, and they have the, the garret, the, the fourth story, um, which is where he did his work. Yes, yeah, so you can see it there. And I think they have, I know they have facsimiles of the first edition of the dictionary, and they have an impressive library. I don't know if they've secured one of the, the original first editions for display there. Johnson's play, yes. Um, he, he, oh, which is the, the Shakespeare play? The Shakespeare play. Um, I can't recall off the top of my head which is the most popular. Several come close to the, the surprises. Henry VIII is very high on the list. Titus Andronicus is far and away the lowest on the list. Of those recognized as Shakespeare's, um, Pericles was not recognized as Shakespeare's in the, in, because it didn't appear in the first folio. Um, so th they were a few of the, the surprises. Um, Hamlet is up there. King Lear might come in first. The, the Henry IV plays. Most of them are what we'd expect, but there were a few that struck me as, as very curious. Well, if there's nothing else, thank you very much for coming. Thanks for the questions, and I'll be glad to talk to your